I will hand over to this evening's presenter. I'm delighted that Professor Vargeson can join us again. He's done things with Techspress in the past, and this is really cool. And I'm sure everybody will really enjoy the presentation. So over to you. Thanks very much, Jenny. Um, hello, everybody. Um, good to see so many of you here, and um, uh, welcome to this to this presentation. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. So. Um, Yes, I'm um, Neil Vargson. I'm, I'm a professor in developmental biology at the University of Aberdeen. Um, my email address is at, is at the bottom of this slide. So if anyone has any questions out with today's lecture or today's talk, rather, you can uh, just send me an email. And I'm going to talk about the, the 60th anniversary of, of, of thalidomide being originally withdrawn from the market, which is the actual anniversary is in a few weeks time. Um, and it was um, and we're going to talk about the history, why it was withdrawn, its renaissance and its mechanisms. Um, so it was, it was withdrawn due to um, it becoming very clear that the drug uh, was causing damage to thousands of, of babies. Um, and it, it, it caused at least 10,000 and some, some sources say it was 100,000 children that were damaged by the drug. And it was, it was, it was, the damage was caused because the drug was used to treat morning sickness um, as well as other treatments and, and this this caused the problem it was with, withdrawn in november 1961 and then it's enjoyed a renaissance since then i mean now it's it's used around the world again to treat a range of conditions and we'll go through those as we go through the talk so what we're going to do today is, is um ask what is the lidomide and what did it do uh why and what is it used for today how did it damage the unborn baby and is it ever going to be safe is it, is it going to be ever made to be safe or, or, or not? And so that's what we'll start with um, today. So um, some background then. So it was it, in the UK, it was released in 1958, um, and it was designed to be a non-addictive, non-barbiturate sedative. And what does that mean? It means a sedative is a drug that calms people down, puts them to sleep, takes away anxiety. I um, mean, and in the 1950s, most sedatives were addictive and barbiturate based. And if you overdosed, you died. So thalidomide was originally made to be a non-addictive, non-barbiturate sedative. And it was very, very powerful, very, very good. And you could take as much of it as you want and it wouldn't harm you in that respect. Um, and it was, very found, it was very, very quickly found to be useful for treating other things. So to put people to sleep, but also for morning sickness. And that was what caused the problem. Um, by 1961, it was sold in 46 countries and sales were second only to aspirin in some countries. It was that popular. And it, it was called, it was never called thalidomide. When it was on the market, it was, it was used, they used different names for it. So Distaval was the name of, of, of thalidomide in the United Kingdom. Countergun was the name in Germany. And there were lots of other names in different countries. Um, and if you, it, it, it was also heavily advertised. So um, this is a, a, an advert from the British Medical Journal in June 1961. So that's five months before the drug is withdrawn and they heavily advertise its safety and they say how, how safe it is, it's effective. Um, there is there's no case on record in which gross overdosage has had harmful results. Um, and five months later, the drug is withdrawn for that very reason. Um, then this is a, an original packet of Distaval that I have in my office. These are some pictures of it. And there's, you know, this, this is from 1961. And there's a couple of things to point out here. One, the lack of information. If, if you go to a, a supermarket now and you, you, you get some paracetamol or some Advil or some ibuprofen to, to, to cure your headache, when you open the packet, you, you, you get four or five pages of information, right? With, with contraindications and, and when not to take and what side effects I might be. And when, if you get this, how to do these things. In the 50s and 60s, you didn't get that. I mean, you, you just got a packet of pills. And you can see um, in, 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 in panel A, the top left-hand corner, um, you can see at the top of this packet, it says physician sample, six tablets. So what does that mean? Well, that is something we don't do today. But in, in, in the 50s and 60s, representatives from drug companies would go around and see clinicians um, and, and give them free samples of a drug and say, yeah, yeah, just, just give this to someone that's got these, these elements and they'll be fine. And that's what the clinicians did. They would give it out to patients for free. Um, 
And, and so we're never going to know the true number of people that were affected by the drug or were influenced by the drug because the records were never kept. Because if you're giving a free sample out, it's not a prescription, therefore you don't make a record of it, right? Um, and so, so they're the two big things, right? The lack of information and then the physician sample thing. And then on the back of the, the packet in panel B um, is, is the information. And I, I love this stuff, right? It's some non-barbiturate sedative and hypnotic, right? That's, that's correct. And then a statement I still don't understand, even though I've had this packet for about 12 years, it calms without euphoria or initial excitement. Yeah, not quite sure what that means. Um, but but the, the really interesting statement is at the very bottom where it says free from untoward side effects. And um, that's an amazing statement to have made um, because we don't know what the testing was, what testing was done. And I'll come back to this in a, in a, in a little while. But as I say, five months after the advert I just showed you, this drug was pulled from the market uh, because it was proven to have been causing damage to, to the unborn babies. So what were the damage? So um, the stereotypical image of a, of a thalidomide survivor in most people's minds is of someone that has got bilateral, that is both arms are shortened, it's called phocomelia. It's where the long bones are missing or very, very short and you have digits either from the end of a short and humerus radius ulna, or you have them from the shoulder blade. Um, but that's not the only thing. I mean, uh, many survivors do have phocomelia. Some don't. Some have, um, as was as we uh, as we come to radial dysplasia. But the, the lower limbs were also affected. Not as common as the upper limbs, but they were also affected. But survivors also have other problems: uh, damage to the ear, the eye, the face genitals, internal organs, the kidneys, the cardiovascular system, the gut, reproductive organs, nerve damage. In fact, most tissues are sensitive to thalidomide and no two thalidomide survivors are identical um, and they may have combinations of this damage. They might, they might have limb damage and internal organ damage or they might have all of these things depending on how severe the damage was. Um, it was in 1961 that Wittgen Lenz in Germany and Bill McBride in Australia independently of each other worked out that only children born to mums that took thalidomide to treat morning sickness had children with damage. And so that's why the drug was removed in late November 61. And Vidikin Lenz also worked out that he worked out the time period approximately when the drug was active. And he found that there is a small window of time, about 16 to 17 days, um, 20 that, the 20th, the 20th day of development to the 36th day of development when this drug is causing outward damage. And what I mean by outward damage is damage to the, to the eyes, the ears, the limbs. Okay, the damage internally is another story, but this is the critical period of development. And it's this time period, day 20 to day 36, in embryonic terms is really important because this is when the body is forming. This, this, this sort of day 20 to day 40 is, is when the, the, the limbs are growing out of the body, the, the, the eyes are forming, the ears, the internal organs. And so this drug was caused a lot of damage very, very rapidly. And it's, it's incredibly potent. One of the most potent um, chemicals to cause damage to, to the unborn that we know of. And what's very interesting is if you look at this figure, you'll see that in the early part of the window, sort of around about day 25, you can see it's causing damage to lots of different tissues. And by the end of it, day 36, it's causing damage just to the thumb. Um, and and Len, Vidic and Lenz then said that, hinted that actually, if you took the drug before this time window and after the time window, then there'd, there'd be no damage. But um, I think today, uh, as you're gonna see, um, I don't think there is, there is no such thing as a, a safe time to take thalidomide during pregnancy. If you take it before day 20, you'll end up in a miscarriage. And if you take it after day 36, you'll have internal organ problems. And we'll, we'll go through that as the talk progresses. So this, this, is, this is what's known as a thalidomide tragedy. And it, it completely changed the way we, we test our drugs. And it, it, it gave birth to the field of toxicology of, of how you really make sure drugs are safe and they do what they're supposed to be doing. Up to the 1960s, drugs effects on the embryo were carried out, but they weren't vigorous and they weren't full. And it depended on which country you were in as to what you did. And then sometimes it was company specific. So not all companies uh, tested their drugs on pregnant species. Um, there was a view that um, the placenta might actually uh, stop those sorts of things, of uh, getting to the unborn child. Uh, completely wrong, but there was that view. And, and 
it, most drugs were tested on animal, adult animals. Um, questions do remain as to what testing was carried out and whether the disaster could have been prevented. And I, I think I'd go further than that and say, you know, that the company claim or say that they did all the testing that was required at the time. And I've just told you that there were, there were issues with testing in, in that era. The, the bigger question to me is when did they know that it was causing damage and could they have removed it sooner than they actually did? Um, and then the tragedy also opened our eyes to species differences. And um, it turns out that um, thalidomide does not affect uh, pregnant rodents, mice and rats, in, in the same way that it does rabbits, um, fish and chickens. And so it really did open our eyes that, you know, we need to be testing in multiple species to make sure we, 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 don't, we don't have another tragedy like this again. And now drugs are vigorously tested and you have to go through, you have to use multiple species of animals, you have to have preclinical trials, clinical trials in multiple uh, formats in order to make sure a drug is safe. And that's all down to the thalidomide tragedy. Um, but it's not over. Tragedy is not over, far from it. You, the, the survivors of thalidomide um, all around the world are, are now into in the, the late 50s and early 60s, and they're all suffering from early onset age-related disorders such as arthritis. And they, they, they had to, they've had to change the way that they use their bodies in order to, 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 to meet the lifestyle that's been um, occurred because of the damage that they've got. So they're, they're suffering from early onset age problems. And there are groups of alleged survivors still seeking recognition um, around the world. And that includes in the United States, Canada, Spain, Italy, Ireland, and others. Um, and there are still large numbers of people that um, are, are, unrec are not formally recognized as survivors, which 60 years after the event is, is um, still kind of shocking. So since the, the tragedy, um, the, the, the drug is being used around the world again. And, and the reason for that is because it has multiple actions in the body. It, it, it's, it's not just a sedative, so it's not just affecting the nervous system where it can calm the nervous system down, but it's, it breaks down into lots of different byproducts, and these byproducts have been shown to have multiple actions. So um, it, it's called anti-angiogenic. What that means is, is it destroys blood vessels. Um, anti-inflammatory means that it, your inflammatory response is, is reduced to zero. And in some inflammatory conditions like Crohn's disease, um, which is what thalidomide is used for, that's how it works. It stops the inflammatory system from over, overreacting and therefore calms down your conditions. It also has effects on the immune system and it has effects on the nervous system. It was originally designed to be a sedative. So of course it's going to still have effects on the nervous system, but long-term use can be found to be neurotoxic. And this was described by an Aberdeen doctor um, in December, 1960. So it's got multiple actions. And this is why it's now used around the world today to treat a variety of conditions, successfully I might add. And the reason why these are successfully treated is because there are patient protection programs in place. So if you use thalidomide now for any of the treatments I'm about to discuss, you have to be on a PPP, a patient protection program. And that means you have to be on um, uh, contraceptives and you have to have regular uh, pregnancy tests to make sure that you're not pregnant. Um, so it's used to treat erythema and nodosum leprosum, which is a complication of leprosy. And this is caused by an overactive inflammatory response to the bacterium that causes leprosy. And it results in really painful lesions on, on, around the body. And if you look at this panel um, underneath A, the before and the after, you can see these horrible uh, swellings on this patient's leg. And if you look at the after six weeks, you can see they're all gone. So thalidomide is really good at treating that, that condition. It's also used to treat multiple myeloma, um, which is an overproduction of, of, of B cells in your blood. And it's actually can prolong patients' lives by up to 18 months. Um, and given the fact that it affects blood vessels, it's also in trial to treat um, cancers. So it's an anti-tumor agent as well. And then just this year or the last year or so, um, it, it's also in trial now as a potential treatment for COVID-19 induced lung inflammation. Because of its potent anti-inflammatory actions, it's thought that it could actually protect uh, COVID-19 patients' lungs. And there is some evidence for that. Um, thalidomide was also used when swine flu broke out in 2009 for the same reasons. So it's got all these different actions. Um, and uh, it's, when it's used safely, it is very effective. However, we um, are seeing a new generation 
of thalidomide survivors in Brazil. We've not seen, not seen thalidomide survivors in any other country in the world, but Brazil has seen um, a significant population. And this is, this is recent, and this is because um, leprosy is endemic in Brazil, and patients, they live in villages, so they can be several days away from a hospital. So they go to the hospital, they get their medicine, they come back to the village, and they think they're doing the right thing by then sharing the medicine, but they don't realize that they shouldn't be doing that. And so you've now got uh, another generation of, of children. Here's a picture of a, of a girl that's got a, 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 a reduced limb. You can see that her humerus, the upper part of the limb and the forearm are very short and then she's got digits from, from the, the shortened arm. Um, she has some other features of thalidomide as well. So, um, so this is a problem, right? Um, when, it's, when, when you've got patient protection programs, that's fine. But if you take it by mistake and you don't realize that you're pregnant, there is the risk of, um, of damage to the embryo. So, so then how does thalidomide cause damage to the embryo? And, and can, you, can a form of the drug ever be made that retains clinical benefits without the side effects, particularly those that cause damage to the embryo? And that's what the rest of this talk is going to be on. Um, but first, um, I, I'm going to show you some pictures of some chicken embryos that we use in the lab to reciprocate thalidomide-induced damage in humans and how we've come to some conclusions. And I wanted to, um, I want, I wanted to, to make the, use this slide to make the point of why we use chickens, fish, and mice um, in research, particularly for, for for drug development. And this is a, a slide I'd like you, that we're gonna set a poll up in a second. And I'd like you to select, th these are seven vertebrate embryos. That's embryos with, a, with a, a backbone. And I'd like you to select the human one, okay? You've got A, B, C, D, E, F, or G. Each one is a different species of um, animal on this planet. And I want you to pick the human embryo. So if you could, I'll give you about a minute to do that. So just um, on the poll, just, pick, just click on the, the letter that you think it is. And I'll give you a minute to, to do that. How are we doing? Have we, um, has everyone had a go? Okay, shall we end that poll then please? and see what we got. Okay, excellent. <laughs> so two people, okay. So the majority have gone for D and um, that's, that's a, as I expected, that, that's not a human embryo. Um, some have gone for G, um, that's also not a human embryo. And then um, two people got it correct. Um, I'm, I'm hoping they'll be my students then. Um, so that's, that's fantastic. So. Let me, um, so well done for that. Um, this is the answer. Um, so the human is actually panel C. The mouse is D, chicken is G, uh, fish is E, and you can see a, a hedgehog as well here, B. Okay, and the point is, is the human embryo is incredibly hard to distinguish from these other species. There's a, there's a particular time point in development called the phylotypic period, where all vertebrate embryos look similar. And that's because they go through similar developmental processes. And it's really hard to distinguish them. And you can see a chicken, um, a mouse, and even a hedgehog look remarkably similar to the human. And that's because uh, they go through, early development is very, very similar in those species. It's only after the phylotypic period where you get the species differences and we, we, we all develop differently. But early development, these species look similar. So that's why we use chickens, fish, and mice in our research. 
So, um, so what are the mechanisms of thalidomide action? So since 1962, over 30 models have been proposed. Okay, I'm not gonna go through them all with you because there's quite a lot, obviously. Some of them have got some evidence which we'll come to and some of them don't. But I think today it's fair to say that three um, are believed to be involved um, or have a role. And these are not mutually exclusive. I think these are related. I think these are linked into each other. And I'll show you a, a summary picture at the end of the talk that, that, that shows that. So the drug's actions on the blood vessels, the ability of the drug to induce cell death, and the ability of the drug to bind um, some molecules called cerebron cell 4 and P63 are, are widely accepted of how this drug acts. Okay, but questions still remain as we're going to see. These aren't, uh, I don't think, I think there's more molecular targets than just these three, but we'll, we'll come to that. So they're the three things we're going to focus on. Um, and I should also point out that molecular screens done on, on embryos that have been treated with this drug show 2000 gene profile changes following exposure. So there's a potentially an awful lot of drug, uh, a lot of genes that could be affected here. So I, I told you then that the drug has um, multiple actions. Um, and so, you know, we could take thalidomide and we could put it onto a chicken embryo and say, well, well what's it going to cause? Well, well, we know what it will cause. It will, it will cause damage to the limbs, to the eyes, to the ears, et cetera, et cetera. But, but what we were interested in is actually saying, well, which of these actions causes the problems? Is it, is it the action on the blood vessels? Is it the action on the inflammatory system? Is it the action on the immune system? Is it the action on the nerves? Because we know the drug has those actions. So which of those actions causes the problem? And the, the wonderful thing about science is you can collaborate with fantastic people. And I was a, I, I collaborate with um, a guy called Doug Fig, who works at the National Cancer Institute in the United States. And he's a pharmacologist. And he produces uh, versions of thalidomide with specific actions. And he's identified versions of the drug that only, only affects the, the blood vessels, versions that only affect the inflammatory system, and versions that only affect the immune system. And so what you can then do is you can then put them onto chicken embryos and say, which class or which action is causing the problem? And this is, this is one of my most favorite um, experiments I've ever done in my life. What this is showing you is chicken embryos. On the left-hand side is a normal chicken embryo with no drug applied. On the right-hand side is a chicken embryo that's had um, a, a version of the drug that um, is affecting one of those actions. And on the left-hand side, I hope you can see labeled is the eye, the forelimb, the somites, which go on to make your vertebral column. Um, and on the right-hand side, I hope you can see that the spine has a slight bend in it about halfway down. And I hope you can see that the upper limb is a stump, okay? It's very, very small, all right? And if basically what this is, is this, this, this action of the drug is the, the blood vessels. It's affecting the blood vessels only. Okay, and if you add this drug a little bit later in development, you can then get differences in the damage you see in the limbs. So it's, it's reciprocating what we see in humans. There's a time sensitive window and the later in development you take it, the, the less severe damage that you see, if you remember. So this is a picture here. Um, panel C is a normal chicken wing. You've got the humerus, radius and ulna, just as we have. And then they have the first three digits that we have. We have two extra digits, otherwise it's the same. And the image I just showed you is in panel D, and you can see what appears to be the top of the humerus um, and then a digit sticking from the humerus. It's close to folk as you're gonna see. If you add the drug a little bit later in chicken development, you've got radial dysplasia. And this is where you've got the humerus and the ulna, but you're missing the radius in digit one. And we'll come back to this a little bit later. And then if you add it even later, you see uh, an even uh, a different type of damage you see now the humerus, what appears to be an ulna, and then a digit from that as well. So by, by using a version of the drug that only affects the blood vessels, um, we've got damage to the limbs and we've got a range of damage over a time period. So we, we're reciprocating what you see in thalidomide survivors in humans. If you add um, versions of the drug that only affect the inflammatory response or the, or, or the immune system, um, you don't cause any damage to the embryo or to the limbs at all. And this, this, this image is just showing you that. You can see that these limbs are all normal and that's after adding, uh, after adding these versions of the drug. Um, and so 
what that's telling us is it's, it's, the, it's the angiogenic action of the drug, the, the, the action of the drug destroying the vessels that's causing the problem, okay? That's what's causing the damage. Um, if you do some experiments where you block nerves, you block the function of the nerves, the limbs also form normally. So of those four functions that thalidomide has got, it's the, it's the action on the blood vessels that's causing the actual damage patterns. Now, I can hear some of you thinking, well, that, that's, that's great, but why did it only affect the upper limb in that particular embryo? And that's a really good question, and, and one that took us a, a bit of time to, to resolve, but it turns out to be um, a quite a simple answer, um, as, as most things are in science. Um, so, so a quick overview of blood vessel development. Blood vessels form by two mechanisms. The first is by vascular genesis. This is where the first blood vessels in the embryo form. They form by endothelial cells, which make blood vessels. They migrate towards each other. They form a ball of cells, and then they make a hole in the middle of that to make a blood vessel, okay? Well, we can't, thalidomide can't be affecting that process because if it was, you'd never have an embryo because you'd never have any, any blood vessels. The second process is angiogenesis. And that's where you take this um, initial blood vessel and then the endothelial cells that make, it, make, make up this vessel, they start to divide and then they migrate out and they migrate towards tissues that are requiring oxygen and nutrients. And this is called angiogenesis. And that's how you get the vascular network. If, if you look at your hands, the top of your hand, you can see your blood vessels. All of those vessels were formed by angiogenesis, okay? And once the vessel is formed, it then develops smooth, a smooth muscle coat. And smooth muscle is important on all of our blood vessels because this protects the blood vessel. It also allows blood pressure to be maintained and allows blood to pump around the body. And it turns out, I'm not gonna show you the data because it's, too, it's too, too much detail to go into, but I'd be happy to discuss it if you want to. It turns out that if you make um, cultures of blood vessels and then you uh, add the drug to um, smooth muscle negative blood vessels, they are destroyed. And if you add the drug to smooth muscle positive blood vessels, they are absolutely unharmed. And it turns out that the reason why the, the, the limbs were affected at the time points I added the drug to those chicken embryos is because the limb at that particular point of development is the, one of the fastest growing tissues in the embryo and it doesn't have any smooth muscle on its blood vessels. But even the vessels in the head at that time do have smooth muscle, which is why they were not damaged, okay? So it turns out that the drug is destroying newly formed or newly forming vessels and it's killing them. And that's preventing, that's going to cause cell death and it's then preventing the tissue from growing out. And areas that have got smooth muscle positive vessels are fine, okay? But if you, if you then add the drug at an earlier time point when all the vessels are undergoing angiogenesis, i.e. they have no smooth muscle, then the entire embryo is killed off. And that's why I don't think you can apply, if you, if you took this drug before the time sensitive window that Biddick and Lenz described, um, I think you'll end up with a miscarriage. You won't end up with a normal embryo at all because I think all the vessels will be destroyed. And, and we, we can further prove that because if you then add the drug later in development, when there is more smooth muscle on the blood vessels in the limb, you get different types of damage. So you can see on the top panel, uh, stage 23 or E4, um, you lose the digits, you lose the hand plate. Of, of, the, of the limb. And that's because the vessel, we, we, we've shown in, in, in images that the vessels in the, in the, where the humerus, the radius and the ulna are have smooth muscle, but the vessels in the hand plate do not. And if you go even later, you get a normal limb apart from the digit tips, which are missing. And again, that's because the digit tips are still forming and they don't have vessels with smooth muscle. So they're, they're destroyed. So this, this seems to be how the drug is causing the damage. It's causing it by and destroying blood vessels, causing cell death, and then you lose the tissue. Now, and it, it, there's another interesting aspect to this. Um, in humans, now these, these are images of human limbs developing, okay? And there is a, a very important transition from the embryonic to the adult arterial patterns throughout the body um, in early development. In fact, between weeks four and eight, you go from an embryonic arterial pattern to your final adult pattern. It, it happens quite early in development. And in the limbs, it's between weeks four and a half and seven and a half. And what I hope you can see is on the left-hand side, 
you can see a limb bud that looks a little bit like a chicken's, right? It's, you can see this little, there's a, some vessels in there in a, in a nondescript way. It's, it's called a vascular plexus. It's all over the limb bud. And as you see the bones forming at about week 5.8, here's this humerus, you start to see this vascular plexus becoming an artery. And then as the other bones, the radius and ulna come on, you can see these other arteries forming around them. And by the middle of the eighth week, you've now got your adult pattern. Now, what's interesting is that this equates to approximately the time sensitive window that Fiddikin Lens identified. And so basically what's going on is that the, the, the time sensitive window is also the time window when these vessels are undergoing this embryonic to adult tra arterial transition. And so you can imagine then that if this drug comes in and damages the blood vessels at week 5.8, the humerus is formed, but you can now see that you're not gonna get the arteries in the right place. Therefore, this will affect the radius and the ulna and ultimately affect the digits as well, resulting in problems. Either you'll have a smaller radius, smaller ulna, or you may have missing radius, missing ulna. Um, and equally, if you, if you did this earlier, you, you could lose the humerus, okay? So that's, that's our logic, that's our thinking of, of what's going on here. We think that this is how the drug actually causes the damage that you see in survivors. Now, what's also interesting, is in an adult's arm, each of the long bones, um, and this is the same in the legs, it's also the same for some of the, some of the organs, they're supplied by different numbers of arteries. So, so the radius is supplied by one artery, the radial artery, and the ulna is supplied by two or three arteries, depending on development time. And so what that could, that, what that could mean is that the radius is more sensitive to thalidomide than the ulna, because you only have to lose one blood vessel. And if you lose that radial artery, the radius can't form correctly because you need the blood to make the, the bones grow. But the ulna, you need to lose an awful lot of arteries. So it could explain um, this condition, radial dysplasia, which quite a few thalidomide survivors have. This is an X-ray of someone, um, a thalidomide survivor. And what you can see is they've got three or four digits. They're missing the thumb. They're missing the radius completely. They've got um, a small humerus and they've got an ulna just here. And the ulna, in fact, is the, the last bone to be affected in the arm um, in, in thalidomide embryopathy. The radius is the most sensitive, or the thumb is the most sensitive, followed by the radius. Um, then it's the humerus and then it's the, the ulna. So this, this might explain why the radius is, is much more sensitive than the ulna because it's the way that the vessels are, are, are innovating them. So um, that was angiogenesis and cell death. So angiogenesis then is, is you know, you, the, the drug is blocking angiogenesis, it's stopping new vessel formation. The tissue then starts to die off by induction of cell death. The cells then die back and you get a, a, a tissue deformity. Now I mentioned cerebellum um, cell 4 and P63, and these are molecules that have been identified recently, but questions still remain. Now, cerebellum is, um, is, is a known binding target of thalidomide, and that was discovered um, by Hiroshi Handler's lab in 2010. And cerebellum is a ubiquitin ligase. Now a ubiquitin ligase is a very important molecule. That's the molecule that tags other molecules for destruction. So for example, if you've got an embryo and it's developing and you've got a signal there that's saying, let's, make an, uh, let's control the number of digits that, we, that we, we're making, um, and it's done that job, how do you get rid of that signal because you, you no longer need it? That's what a ubiquitin ligase would do. It would go along and destroy that, to, so it stops the function of these things. And in the adult, we know an awful lot about cerebellum and thalidomide's complex. They, they, they bind each other, they form a complex, and we know that thalidomide binding to cerebellum controls the inflammatory response because that combination blocks the formation of TNF-alpha, which is the mediator of the inflammatory response. And we also know that th thalidomide binding to cerebellum, it can also bind other molecules and that explains how it, um, how it's, how, how it kills multiple myeloma cancer cells off, okay? Um, so a little bit more, it, it's not, the, the, the action in the embryo of these molecules is not as well understood, but but it's getting clearer. Um, and we know that um, cerebellum binds thalidomide in the embryo and it can inhibit other targets. Um, and we know that if you make a zebrafish embryo that can't um, 
bind, uh, where cerebellum is deficient and it can't bind thalidomide, the, the cerebrophage embryo appears to be immune to thalidomide's action. So we know cerebellum's involved. We know that cerebellum can bind uh, SAL4 and P63, and SAL4 and P63 are two genes that are involved in limb development and embryonic development. Um, and SAL4 in particular, if, if, if you, you can get a, a human condition, a uh, syndrome caused by genetic mutation, it's called Okihiro-like syndrome. Um, and this looks like thalidomide embryopathy. You've got damage to the arms, the eyes, the ears, some of the internal organs. Um, and so, and so there has been some confusion between Okihiro-like syndrome patients and thalidomide embryopathy because they do look very similar. So it makes sense that SAL4 might be involved, but, but SAL4 mutations don't affect the legs. So there must be something else. And then P63 mutations, they, they cause limb and hearing uh, problems in humans as well. So yes, P63 via thalidomide and cerebellum could explain some of the damage like SAL4, but it can't explain all of it. So there must be some other targets, but these are, these are good candidates for, for, for causing some of the damage. Um, and then we have another one called Argonaut 2, which I'm interested in. Um, this is expressed in blood vessels um, and is also downregulated by thalidomide. And so these, these genes, we don't know much about them completely. We're still looking into them, but um, we, we believe that these are involved, okay? Um, but the action I've just described about the blood vessels that thalidomide has on the blood vessels doesn't require cerebrum, okay? Um, Several groups have reported now that um, if you don't have cerebellum in the endothelial cells, uh, thalidomide still affects the blood vessels. So that would suggest that um, there are other targets, there are other mechanisms. And that might explain why there's this wide variance in damage patterns between survivors. Because if you've got multiple ways of, of damaging the embryo, um, then depend, and it probably depends on the timing. So earlier in development, you're affecting several different mechanisms. Later in development, you're affecting probably just one. So what I'm, what I'm trying to say here is we, we, we know an awful lot more about how the thalidomide acts in the embryo, but there are still questions remaining and we're still trying to identify molecular targets. But the, the, how it causes the damage is becoming much clearer and that, that appears to be through cell death being induced through the loss of blood vessels. So this is, this is my framework of how the drug acts on the embryo. <clears throat> this is um, something that keeps me awake at night. Um, Seriously, I, I do have a, another version of this on my computer at work uh, where I have all the genes ever identified that, that are involved. Um, and this is my summary one. But um, I think what's going on is the thalidomide is, is binding some sort of molecular target. And we've discussed that it could be cerebellum, it could be SAL4, it could be Argonaut 2. And I've also mentioned that SAL4 and Argonaut 2 are also expressed in blood vessels. So there is, there is a question that could thalidomide directly bind SAL4 and Argonaut 2 in blood vessels. Um, and are there other targets? I think there probably are other targets. We've, we've discussed that. Um, and what, what then happens is you then get inhibition of the of blood vessels. This causes cell death. You then get changes in localized gene expression in limbs, for example. This then causes your organ tissue damage. Um, and then you get secondary cell induction problems. And what I mean by that is things like muscles and nerves. These Muscles and nerves go into tissues, kidneys, liver, heart, vessels, things like that, after the tissue is formed. You don't want them going in before the tissue is formed as it's forming because they're going the wrong places. So what, what that means is that after the tissue has been damaged, you then get the normal induction of nerves and muscles going into the tissue, but they go to the wrong place and they, they make things far worse. So that's, that's how I think it works. Um, and as I say, we're still looking at trying to identify molecular targets. And then finally, uh, the, the second part of the, um, the, the challenges, which will take two slides. I mentioned that we would, can you make forms of the drug that don't have the, uh, the actions that cause damage? And we've, I've just shown you some evidence that it's the, it's the, the action of the, on the blood vessels that's actually causing the tissue damage. It's not the action on the inf inflammatory response of the immune system. And so, can you make a form of the drug that doesn't affect the blood vessels, but does affect the inflammatory response and doesn't cause birth defects? And again, using my collaborator, Doug Fig, we made various different versions of the drug that had various actions. And through screening in chickens and in zebrafish embryos, and this green one, this green picture here is a, is a, a zebrafish embryo that's all the blood vessels are lit up in green fluorescent protein. Um, we found that we identified 13 
that were just affecting blood vessels. And so these might actually be useful for, for cancer treatments, but we found 10 that we think are purely anti-inflammatory. They don't affect blood vessels, they don't cause any damage to the embryo. And so these are the 10 that we're now following up on to see if we could actually at some point bring these to the market and then withdraw thalidomide from the market again. Um, because thalidomide is, although it's safe when you take it in patient protection programs, when it isn't taken safely, as in Brazil, it's still causing problems. So we'll see how that goes. But that's the answer. The answer to, so the, answer to the question is yes, we think we can make safer forms of the drug. Um, and I will end there and I'll thank you very much for your time. Um, I need to thank these people because um, they did some of the work and um, I, I did some of it too, but they did more than I did. And I've also summarized other people's work and, and their work is cited. Um, I also thank uh, Doug and Nigel who, for being great collaborators because they supplied lots of the reagents. And my email address is at the bottom if you have any other questions. And I hope um, that rather whirlwind tour uh, was, was, was okay and was, clear and I hope I've explained to you how the drug worked, how it causes damage to the embryo and how we can make it safer. Thank you very much. That was great, thanks Neil. Um, I'm not sure if we've got any questions in the chat, but oh yes we do, that's good. I was gonna say if not, I've definitely got one. Um, so Alexandra has asked, I think it was answered in this last slide, but it was said early on that thalidomide, thalidomide sorry, is being studied as an anti-tumor medication. Would that be because of its restriction on specific growth factors like VEGF, or is it the general anti-angiogenic effect? And if so, does that mean that only specific analogs could be effective as cancer treatments? Uh, it, so it's used as an anti-tumor agent um, because of its ability to destroy blood vessels, um, and it's very effective. Um, we, th there is some evidence that it blocks VEGF, yes, VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor. Um, there is, there's quite a lot of evidence. It, it also blocks other genes that are thought to be involved in blood vessel formation. So the anti-angiogenic ones, the, the ones that affect the blood vessels, yes, they, they, it, it may well be that they are, they are selective, that we, we, we might use one for one cancer and one for a different type of cancer, because each cancer is slightly different in the way that it, it gets vascularized. And, but we haven't done enough work on that as yet. But um, those, the, the ones that we do have um, are very potent. They, they destroy the vessels very, very quickly. Um, and so we're hoping that they could be used um, for some cancers anyway. Okay, um, we have another question from Jackie, who says, have you looked at anti-nuclear antibodies in the blood? She's interested as a thalidomide, thalidomide survivor with an autoimmune disorder in recent years. She also says, super talk, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Jackie, that's very kind. Um, no, I haven't looked for that. And that, that might be a good thing to look at, you're right. Um, and I will see what I can do about that. Um, the, the, the drug does, does affect the immune system, so it's not without the bounds of possibility that something could have happened um, in the embryo, when you were an embryo and um, there's a, there's a, there's a, some sort of immune risk reaction now, but um, I don't think that's been looked at specifically. I'll, I'll have to have a check and I'll certainly will look into it. Thank you for the question. Okay, I've got one, just out of curiosity. Um, oh, and Jackie says thank you. Um, when you showed the first slide um, with the sample packets, what did they give this drug to children for? I mean, I can understand being given for morning sickness or error you know, as a calming drug, but for children, it's, it seems a bit like chucking sweeties at them that they shouldn't yeah. have or something. <laughs> well, it's a good question. You know, um, children that don't sleep very well, that are very hyperactive, right, okay. that suffer from anxiety, um, that, that was what it was used for. It was, it was basically to calm people down. Um, that's what a sedative is, right? Um, and, you know, if, if you're very anxious or you're very stressed out um, and you can't cope that you would be given thalidomide to, to do that and it, it was uh, effective and um, you, you could take you can you can take an awful lot of it it won't cause any problems mm. um, whereas the standard sedatives at that time barbiturates you they were addictive and yeah. um, you could OD and die it, so they, you know distaval was and other forms of thalidomide around the world weren't just given in tablets, sometimes they were, they were liquid as well. So 
you could get a liquid for kids as well. Um, so it's like like a like a you know like a cow pole. Um, you could take it if, if the kids were having difficulty sleeping. Or okay. Whatever. But yeah, there's no, no, I, there's, no evidence, there's no evidence that after but after after the formation of the baby, so after birth, there's no evidence that thalidomide might any cause any problems. But um, uh, you know, you just don't know because as I said to you, it, long term use of this drug causes peripheral neuropathy. Mm -hmm. uh, that was discovered in 1960. What that is is it's where the nerves in your in your limbs are damaged and it's really painful. Um, and there's also health warnings on thalidomide now uh, that suggest that it can cause blood clots. So, you know, it, it's it needs to be taken in a, in a safe way. So this advert, um, yeah, was it was done in a different era. And um, yeah, yeah. Um, there's a message in the chat box from the Irish Thalidomide Association who say excellent talk. Thank you. So uh, thank you to Finola for that. That's very kind. Thank you very much, Finola. Um, OK, Alexandra's got another question. She says, how did you decide that this was the domain you wanted to go into specifically? And also, I think I remember from a documentary that distribution started in Germany. Yeah, OK, so how did I get into this? Um, I, I'm a developmental biologist. I, I'm fascinated um, how, I, how you go from a single cell to a fully formed individual and, and why in the vast majority of cases that that goes according to plan. But, but why does it go wrong in 3% in of births a year? And um, thalidomide is, is uh, I, I thought, um, a family friend who, who was damaged by thalidomide. Um, and I, I was never able to answer why. And um, being a limb developmental biologist, um, you'd, you'd think we'd know that. We, you know, how, how, how do you get, how does thalidomide cause limb defects or limb damage and things? And um, we couldn't answer it. So I got, in, I got interested for several reasons. One, uh, the, 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 just the, 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 always been interested in, in, in how thalidomide acts since I was younger. And then secondly, I, I saw pictures of babies in Brazil um, in, in the 1990s that, that got thalidomide embryopathy. And I just thought, well, that, why is that happening? How is that happening? Can we stop that? And the combination of that, um, is, is, is de I've been devoted for it for 25 years. And it, it, anyone that knows me knows I'm, I'm a bit OCD about it. So it, it's, it, it's, so that's what got me into it. And, um, other things have stemmed off. So now I'm also interested in drug safety. So how, how do you make a safe drug? And it, it, it's bigger than that now. So if you think about a, a, a colleague of mine made a great analogy, you know, when, when the cars first came out in the late uh, 1890s, whatever it was, the, the Ford Model T, very, very different to cars of today, right? Cars today, we've got electric cars now, they've got all these safety features, but we haven't done that with our drugs. Our drugs seem to be, you, you come up with a drug, you market it and that's it, you just use it. So paracetamol, ibuprofen, Advil, they're, all, they're the same as they've been for years and years and years. And I just wonder if we need to start looking at our drugs like that and if we, we need to start um, redesigning drugs for certain conditions um, and making them safer or as safe as they possibly can be. All drugs will have some sort of risk, of course, but um, thalidomide, you know, you take it to treat myeloma, you, you are going to be affecting your nervous system, your immune system and your vascular system at the same time. So that, that's, that's why I feel we need to, particularly with thalidomide, we need to make newer versions or new drugs to treat those conditions that eradicate that. Um, and yes, distribution started in Germany. It was invented in Germany, um, started in Germany, and then uh, it was licensed to different companies to, to distribute it in different countries, yes. Um, I think that answers Alexandra's question. Um, John wants to know, how does it reduce nausea then? That's a really good question. Um, <laughs> it, it, we know that it, it dampens down the nervous system. So we, we, we believe it's because the nerves that are associated with nausea would be dampened down by the drug. But it's not 100% it's not certain how it does that. Um, but if you think about a sedative, a sedative works by, uh, by re probably reducing the action potentials in your nerves. So it's stopping the communication of the nerves. So it's slowing it down. And so if you do that, if you're, if you're, if you're slowing the nervous system down, that's probably going to have an effect where you, you no longer feel nauseous because all the nerves are, are calmed down. That's what we think anyway. Okay. 
Um, Finlay has asked a question. Do the lessons from thalidomide offer a word of caution from the rapidly expanding application of the COVID vaccines? Um, no, not really. I mean, apart from drug safety, I mean, thalidomide was um, was not tested properly, right? Um, and the very, very different era. I mean, mm -hmm. animals, and we, we didn't test animals on animals the way we did. We didn't have clinical trials. We didn't have preclinical trials. Um, but what thalidomide did do, it did change the way we test and it, it, it raised awareness. And now we do have a system where if people have concerns about a medicine, and that includes the COVID vaccines, you, you contact the authorities who then yellow, is it yellow form that you fill in? Um, and then if, if enough people make those concerns, it's looked into. And I think that worked with some of the COVID vaccines. The AstraZeneca, for example, is no longer given to anyone under the age of 40 because of the risk of blood clots. So mm. if anything, I think thalidomide has made the place safer. And it's, it's, particularly with the COVID vaccines, I'm, I, I believe they are safe. And I think that's due in part because of the way that the world united behind this. Nothing's ever been done like this before with the COVID vaccines. I mean, you had groups from all over the world sharing data. You had regulatory bodies sharing data, which doesn't normally happen. Normally it takes years to get these things done, but it's because they shared the data. Um, and then when concerns did come up, they were investigated and looked at straight away by different groups. So um, the, I, I guess it doesn't offer a word of caution, but I think the, the thalidomide tragedy um, has helped make drugs safer across the world. Yeah, I guess that's the thing, isn't it? It sometimes takes a tragedy to make things safer, and that happens in many different spheres, not just in, in drugs. Sure. Um, and, you know, if it wasn't thalidomide, it would have been another drug. It, mm -hmm. it was waiting to happen because drugs weren't being tested correctly. But, you know, since the thalidomide disaster, there hasn't been on the same scale another disaster like it, but there have been issues. So, for example, um, uh, sodium valparate, which is used to treat epilepsy. There's, there's some ongoing court cases right now where people have been born recently with, um, with damage due to the, to the nervous systems due to the use of um, sodium valparate during pregnancy. And, the, and the, these poor women weren't told that they should reduce the doses and, and, and space them out. And so, so it's not completely infallible, but it, it's, it's much better than it was. And we, we haven't had the disaster that thalidomide was which is the main thing I, I guess uh, that's the the whole point of sad lessons those these are to have sometimes like I say it does just take um yeah. a tragedy to make things better Sharon has asked um so some mothers experienced peripheral neuro neuropathy as a result of taking the drug was that damage subsequently permanent and lifelong and is it possible that this was then reproduced genetically in their babies mm -hmm. so um peripheral neuropathy is um, damage to the nerve endings um, in, in the peripheral parts of the body. Very, very painful and horrible. And um, it, it can be lifelong, yes. Um, it, it depends how, how much damage there is. Some, you know, the peripheral nervous system does have the ability to regenerate, but it, it can be, it can, it can be uh, permanent. Um, and it, it was prolonged exposure though. So it was like more than six weeks exposure you had to have to get that. So if, if a pregnant mum was taking uh, thalidomide for six weeks during pregnancy, I, 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 would, I don't think the uh, baby would have been born alive. Um, but could it cause damage that could be inherited? No, um, there's, there's no evidence that thalidomide um, causes direct mutations of the DNA that can be inherited to the next generation. Um, it seems to be blocking. So a gene, a gene makes a protein or a signaling molecule or, or transcription factor, it seems to be blocking the ability of that molecule once it's been made by the gene to go about and do its normal function. It does not appear to be affecting the DNA directly. So no, it couldn't be passed on to, um, so thalidomide couldn't be damaging DNA that would then pass on peripheral neuropathy to somebody else, no. So it's not gonna have a knock-on effect to grandchildren or anything like further down the line? No. No, okay. That, I think no, Sharon says thanks, that must have answered a question. Yeah. Um, I don't think we have any other questions. So, nope, that's it. I think all our questions are done. So um, thank you very much. That was a really interesting talk. I think everybody's learned a, a lot and, and you've answered some um, really interesting questions there, that, you know, that, that uh, 
obviously people have been wondering about for for some time. So thank you very much. That was really good. Um, thank you for giving up your time to do this presentation for us. And um, just a reminder to any of the audience that our festival is running until the 1st of December. So um, hopefully we'll see you again online in the next three weeks or so that we're still running. Um, but yeah, thanks very much, Neil. That was just really fascinating. I really enjoyed that. It's an absolute pleasure. And um, I, I thank everybody for, for, for listening and for watching and stuff. And as I say, if you've got any questions you want to ask me, please just feel free to email me. Um, I'm always happy to discuss the little mind. Um, um, thanks again. <laughs>